Assalamu alaikum, Louisville. Saying about some tactics for the revolution um, here in Louisville. That was, uh, there's a third party uh, electoral tactic I'm thinking of. The uh, uh, Get a strong independent movement here. The W.E.B. Du Bois strategy. The W.E.B. Du Bois tactic. So we're going to get the... I'm going to use the W.E.B. Du Bois tactic of promoting independent and progressive candidates over the uh, major party corporate candidates, uh, mostly independents. If there are a few progressive Democrats left, I'll support them too um, and champion them and uh, uh, research the opposition and uh, point out the faults that the opposition would have specifically. Uh, maybe I'm being cynical a little bit. Uh, because the, uh, uh, I am assuming that most of the government is a bunch of professional corruptionists. 23 to 0 is a pretty clear-cut uh, mark about uh, uh, whether or not they're going to vote for the 99%, the camping ban, 23 to 0. So all of them were in solidarity against the 99%, all the city council. That's pretty... Uh, that's some bullshit, but that's the assumption. That's the assumption I'm going with, so they'd have to win me back since they've lost my vote. Um, so that's one way, the third uh, party. But then I was also thinking, too, um, um, some other tactics. I think the uh, street demonstrations are a good idea. I think that's a great idea. In fact, that would take back our democracy. Uh, election Day, we should have a week-long festivities on Election Day if this is a true democracy that we celebrate and we love the freedom of this country. So the uh, I think the, the, the electoral strategy is one strategy, and the public demonstrations, the street demonstrations, is another tactic. Um, we Are Change. We Are Change puts a video camera in the people's uh, decision makers and the politicians face and makes them you know actually say what it is that they believe um, it's kind of it's ambush journalism uh, sometimes you can you know if, if folks are willing to sit down with an interview that says something about them that they're open and they don't mind discussing and answering questions um, but if they are um, evasive and they try to get away from you then you have to you got to get the you got to get the answers. You know they're your representatives, and if you, know, you have some questions and you need to know, and I would love to ask Mayor Fisher what he is doing about the homeless problem, and all of Metro City Council, 23 to zero, they're all going to be against Occupy, right? 23 to zero, going to be against the World Revolution, 23 to zero, going to be against the 99 percent. So, is it the? Uh, I want to I want to know for sure. I want to know for sure. Is it against the 99 percent? Are you against the? The issues that we're bringing to light, or are you just against protesters and homelessness? Are you against the idea that we're pointing out your wrongdoings and uh, pointing out the flaws and inconsistencies of this city and nation and state? Uh, we have not been told the truth. People have not been telling us the truth. And in fact, the only person that told us the truth died this year. He was an independent candidate out of uh, Kentucky, ran for governor like three or four times. Huey Long, Kentucky's Huey Long, he had a plan that would have taken us from poverty to trillionaires. We'd all be Scrooge McDuck around here. We'd all be having uh, lots of calls for our famous bluegrass. But sadly, the there is no third party movement here. It's embedded in our constitution to have a two party system. It's got they are entrenched. Independents have to get five thousand signatures to get on the ballot, whereas um, Democrats and Republicans need two signatures to get on the ballot. So right on the face of it, it's bullshit. Ballot access laws are not equal for independent candidates and for um, major or for new emerging parties. Uh, so that limits them in many ways. It limits to get on the ballot, so that's the the way they they could actually win, right? But it also limits their debate and their organization. And um, if the media doesn't give them credibility, then the media is supposed to inform the public. They're supposed to give us information that makes us better decision makers. That's the role of the media. If the media is not actually telling the people what is going on behind doors, behind scenes, how uh, these decision makers are uh, fucking us over, there's no transparency. They make the decisions, you know, at country clubs and on the golf courses and in their mansions, 
And then they come out and they have this public show where it looks like they're all in solidarity. 23 to 0, right? 23 to 0. That's a show, and that was initiated out of uh, Mayor Fisher's office, so it was his baby. And, you know, to have some say-so in government, I guess you have to sort of make some deal um, about it. But sometimes you got to vote for your conscience, too, you know? So I understand what compromise, but I also understand that there's some things you can't compromise. Economic inequality. Do something about the homeless. You all be doing something about the homeless. If you all make sure that there's no more Fishervilles and there's not 10,000 homeless, then I believe that you're not against the 99%. But I'm willing to guess that a lot of you Republicans don't give a shit about the homeless, and you corporate Democrats, you all don't give a shit about them either. If you don't give a shit about the homeless, you don't give a shit about the least of my people, the most vulnerable amongst us. I don't give a shit about you. You don't give a shit about working class? Go fuck yourself. You don't care about working people? You don't care about the 99%? Fuck you. Alright. So let me get off my soapbox. <laughs> For a second. So um, the new man. So the idea of manhood is what Paulo Freire was talking about. And he was talking about how the oppressed... Instead of seeing that they need to become a new man, they fit the same model and mold as the old man. And the old man, um, um, it is the, uh, you know, for them to become the oppressors. And that's what the new man typ typ typically becomes the old man. But the new man needs to do something different. Their vision of the new man or woman is individualistic because their identification with the oppressor, they have no consciousness of themselves as persons or members of an oppressed class. It is not to become free that they want agrarian reform, but in order to acquire land and thus become landowners, or more precisely, bosses over their workers. It is a rare peasant who, once promoted to overseer, does not become more of a tyrant towards his former comrades than the owner himself. So when you're formally oppressed and then you are elevated to boss, then you become a bigger dick than your actual owner. So this makes you think of managers, shift managers, anybody that has a modicum, a tiny ad, a little bit of authority, um, who's uh, is not worth a frog shit, right? <laughs> so anybody has a tiny bit of authority, they become a tyrant towards their former comrades more so than the owner himself. This is because the context of the peasant situation, that is, oppression, remains unchanged. In this example, the overseer, in order to make sure of his job, must be as tough as the owner and more so. This has illustrated our previous assertion that during the initial stage of their struggle, the oppressed find in the oppressor their model of manhood. So even revolution, which transforms a concrete situation of oppression by establishing the process of liberation, must confront this phenomenon. Many of the oppressed who directly or indirectly participate in revolution indeed conditioned by the myths of the old order to make it their private revolution. This is true, okay? This is true. Fighting for revolution as long as I have, I do have a private revolution that I have in my mind. Um, now, the revolution that I want to unfold here in Louisville is not an idea of my private revolution. It's the idea of, um, I guess it's a humanitarian revolutionary educational pedagogy by Paula Freire. And that pedagogy is, um, it's, it's many things, right? But the main thing is that you uh, adhere to the people. And you go back to the people and you listen to what the people are saying and you make sure that you're legitimate by the people. And if you're always listening to the people and you're, you know, evolving and you're going along and you're listening to what the people are saying and you vote in favor of the people, you kind of like have a, an ear on the ground or you have a finger on the pulse um, of the of the nation or of the city, if you have the finger on the pulse and you're able to speak what it is that the people want at the time that they want it, that makes you a, a better candidate for office. It makes you a better politician, but it also just makes you a better person. It makes sure that the people are getting, you know, the people have to be fed every day. So, you know, if uh, if you're doing things for them, major things for them, and they don't see it, you got to be able to put, like, make a sort of a show, have a PR guy. Um, you know, put out the information about what it is that is being worked on. Uh, that's that's the, uh, I think that's that's key. I think that's absolutely key. That's why I think the way that I would be honest is I would have a working families council, a council of working people, 10, 20 or so, 
uh, people that I would always go to that I would always say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try this idea. Okay, I'll, what do you all think? I was, you know, um, I'll, I'll, you know, fulfill all my campaign promises. Um, but while I'm in office, I may think of some other ideas. And so if I think of some other ideas while in office and I, I would need a backdrop, I would need to present it to somebody before I present it to the general public. And the people that I would present it to would be regular working class folks. And you would tell me exactly what it is you think about it, whether or not I give a good presentation, whether, you know, uh, I should go along with it, whether how to make it better, what I can make it to do to make it tighter, to make it, uh, you know, to make it work. So by having that legit democratic legitimacy, not just a ballot box, because I think a ballot box involves manipulating mass numbers of people, not uh, exactly getting the, the nuts and bolts of the situation. You've got to be legitimate uh, um, to, to working class people. You have to be on the side of working class people. You have to be. I don't see how anybody could run in American politics and not be for working class people. How Republicans get working class people to vote for their own interests, I'll never understand. Roseanne Barr, uh, she had a right. Roseanne Barr, she says that getting working class people to vote for the Republicans is like getting the chickens to vote for Colonel Sanders. And that's true. The chickens are voting for Colonel Sanders, and the chickens have been voting for Colonel Sanders for a long time. The empire has The emperor has no clothes. The emperor is naked. And it takes young people actually to point that out. So the um, a lot of times the even in revolution, the uh, oppressed want to be their own private revolution. So I think that's the key to having the, it not be a private revolution is by always appealing to um, you know the occupied the general assembly to the working groups to other people um, by always getting that uh, uh, validity and validation then you could always you know that you're on the same uh that you're on the same path and that you're all hang, uh you know going towards the same promised land the same dreams of our future so Paula Freire also talks about the fear of freedom and the fear of freedom afflicts the oppressed um footnote this fear of freedom is also found in the oppressors though obviously in a different form the oppressed are afraid to embrace embrace freedom the oppressors are afraid of losing the freedom to oppress so a fear, uh, fear, freedom of fear, which may equally well lead the oppressed to desire the role of the oppressor or bind them to the role of the oppressed, should be examined. One of the basic elements of the relationship between oppressor and oppressed is prescription. So prescription, when people prescribe their knowledge on you, they force what they think onto you. Every prescription represents the imposition of one's individual choice upon another. So not just your ideas, but your choices. I'm going to do this, you're going to do that. That's how this relationship is going to work. So, um, uh, every prescription represents the imposition of one's individual choice upon another, transforming the consciousness of the person prescri prescribed to into one that conforms with the prescriber's consciousness. By forcing them to do and think as you say, then they are um, uh, 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 one consciousness by the oppressor. So you're the, of the oppressor consciousness. So torture works and uh, coercion works and that's why it's used. Intimidation works, that's why people use it. Thus the behavior of the oppressed is a prescribed behavior following as it does the guidelines of the oppressed or the oppressed have an internalized the image of the oppressor and adopt his guidelines are fearful of freedom. Freedom would require them to eject this image and replace it with autonomy and responsibility. And the oppressed do not want autonomy and responsibility. Freedom is acquired by conquest, but not by gift. You have to go out and you have to get freedom. You cannot be gifted freedom. You have to take freedom. You don't have to you don't ask for permission, you ask who's gonna stop me from doing this? I'm gonna do this, now who's gonna stop me? That's what freedom asks. So uh, freedom is acquired by conquest, not by gift. It must be pursued constantly and responsibly. Freedom is not an ideal located outside of man, nor is it an idea which becomes myth. It is rather the indispensable condition for the quest of human completion. And I'll repeat that because I think that's a great line. There's several ways I think about what Paulo Freire says. Um, this idea of freedom is the indispensable condition for the quest for human completion. So freedom is only one necessary component to become fully human. But in order to become fully human, you must have freedom. So if you're oppressed, then you are not free. When you are free, 
that's when you can uh, start to work towards happiness. The other thing that Paula Freire says that the oppressed need to understand their, their situation as a limiting situation that they can transform. So they need to understand that while they are oppressed, there are ways and things that they can do in order to uh, overcome and transform their situation, uh, a limiting situation. So there are things that they can do to make their conditions better and ultimately, hopefully, get uh, emancipated. So, viva la revolution. Occupy Louisville.